Welcome you all and welcome Justin Thomas Daniel um, to our conference today. Um, Daniel received his PhD from Harvard University's Department of Sanskrit and Indian um, Studies in 2003 and he presently teaches Buddhism and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. His research foci include Lao, Thai, Pali and Sanskrit linguistics and literature, Southeast Asian Buddhism, Thai and Lao art, ritual studies, manuscript studies, and Southeast Asian history. He is the chair of the Thailand Laos Cambodian Studies Association and the founder of the NEH, NEH funded Thai Digital um, Monastery Project. He has taught courses in Hinduism, Southeast Asian literature, Buddhism, myth, and symbolism. Southeast Asian history and the study of religion after living and researching in South and Southeast Asia for many years. And his recent publications appear in the Journal of International Association of Buddhist Studies, the Journal of Siam Society, the Journal of Burma Studies, as well as many others. His first book, Gathering Leaves and Lifting Words, Histories of Monastic Education in Laos and Thailand, won uh, a prize, the Harry, uh, excuse me, the Harry J. Bender, uh, Bender Prize for Best first book and Southeast Asian Studies in 2009 and 10. And his second book, The Lovelorn Ghost and the Magic Monk, Practicing Buddhism in Modern Thailand, um, also won awards. He's received many grants and also he's won teaching and advising awards at Harvard University um, and many other institutions. And in 2012, he was named a Guggenheim Fellow. It is with deep um, pleasure that we welcome Justin McDaniel. Thank you for the very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't like to use the mic, so if you need me to speak up, I will. I'm pretty good at projecting my voice, um, especially if my children are running around. Um, <laughs> so today I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to do a few things, and maybe I'm try, I might try to do too much. Uh, so slow me down if, if I'm going too fast. But I'm gonna cover very simple and basic subjects, time and space. So we're gonna deal with space, and then we're going to deal with time, and then we're going to deal with the body, okay? And we'll be able to easily cover this for all of Southeast Asia in attention. <laughs> so, well, what I'm going to try to do is give a foundation for you to understand what I'll do in the second part of the lecture after the break. Um, we're going to look at images of, of uh, the body and images of ritual practices and manuscripts and literature. But I want to give in the first part a foundation for that. Where does all this art come from? Where do these images of the body come from, the ideas of the universe come from? And how does the body and the cosmos connect? So the first part of it is going to be very out there. And then the second part will be much more ground, I hope. So, and please stop me if you have any questions. So, Buddhist notions of space are very similar to Vedic notions of space in Southeast Asia. And so Vedic Hindu notions of space. And so what I say for Buddhists overlap in many ways, not all, but many ways for what you could say about early Vedic notions of, of space and then also time. So in the universe, in the cosmos, the Buddhist cosmos, the Theravada Buddhist cosmos, um, and also all schools of early Buddhism, you had a notion of multiple levels of, loosely we can say heaven, and then multiple levels of hell. So you had 33 levels of heaven, 16 levels of hell, eight if you count them in different ways because hell is really split into hot and cold hells. Um, and sometimes they're also split by gender, but I won't go too much into that. And then uh, you also have these realms in the middle. You have the human realm, the animal realm, and the realm of the hungry ghosts. We'll explain what that is in a second. So let's start with, with, with heavens. Heavens are actually not discussed much by Buddhists in Southeast Asia. And why is that? Because heaven is boring. Okay, in general, in the study of religion, heaven is the most boring thing you can study. Okay? And because it's not supposed to be that exciting, right? It's supposed to be, excitement is sort of tension and anger and personality. Heaven is beyond those things. And so you want it, but when you get there, you're like, eh, you know. So, same thing, Buddhists don't talk much about heaven. So I'm not going to talk too much about it. But there is 33 levels of it. They are split into three categories. The top one is known as Arupa Avachara. You don't need to know these things, but Arupa means non-form. Okay? Rupa and this is a very common in Southeast Asian languages for picture or form. Okay? Like a Thai would say, Tairu, I will take your form, I will take your picture. 
So this is a realm without form. There's no physical limits. There's no cognition. There's no decision making. And there's subtly, subtle differences between these top 11 realms, but they're really boring and no one ever talks about them. There's the Rupa Avachara below that. That's the realm of pure form, <coughs> realm, or realms of pure form. This is more of what we imagine when we maybe think of like the Olympian gods. Okay, everybody's beautiful. They live in palaces. You can see these palaces. There's lakes and there's trees and different jewels. Um, but nothing much happens there because there's really, again, no decision making. People get what they want. There's no struggle. Then there is the relatively interesting head, and that's the Kama Avatara. And this is the realm of pure action. And in this realm, you have what we, I think, think of when you think of maybe Hindu gods and goddesses, or Greek gods and goddesses, or Hittite gods and goddesses, like this, that this is the realm where gods and goddesses are in conflict. They have personality, they have jealousies, they have rivalries, and they, this is the realm where they interact in many ways with other realms, human realms, hell realms. They do things, and they think. So when you do have images, when you're in Southeast Asia, um, when you do have images of heaven, it's generally of these lower, the six lower realms. Below that, you have the humans. We'll get back to them. Humans are quite interesting. Uh, animals, animal realm. There's a lot of controversy over certain plants are considered like animals. Certain plants have sentience. They can feel and make decisions. And then there's the preta realm. Pre, very common word in many Southeast Asian languages for hungry ghost. Hungry ghost. And a hungry ghost is, did you ever watch the Muppets? When you were in the, the Muppets again? The Muppets had that little scientist assistant, you know, Beaker, or Beaker, Beaker, right? And he was getting a really tiny head, right? Right? And that's what a hungry ghost is. Their head is really skinny, okay? They have this tiny little mouth, but they don't have the body like this Beaker. Beaker, look at Beaker. They have these huge, fat bodies, giant bodies, and tiny, skinny heads, and they only can fit a grain of rice in their mouth at any time. Their mouth is so small that only a grain of rice would fit in. And so they're constantly hungry because they've got this <coughs> giant belly and all the stomach acid is churning all the time. They're just hungry. And they can't get <coughs> food in. So they're always wandering around in this world moaning. Uh, and, they would, and they're not scary beings, but they're beings that many people in Southeast Asia feel sympathy <coughs> They want to give food to them. There's many uh, rituals for giving food to the hungry ghosts. This is also in southern China. You find this as well, actually throughout China. And throughout the Buddhist world in some form, but very, very common in Southeast Asia, that you have the sympathy to the ghost realms. And they're there because they lived a life, whether they were humans or gods or goddesses of previous life, they lived a life of only fulfilling their desires. They just, they just took things in, and so in the sense their punishment, their, their punishment justice, is that they can't fulfill their desires, and that they suffer because of their desires. And below that are the hells. Now the hells are really common to depict in Southeast Asia, and very, very popular. And we'll show images later, I'll show lots of uh, very kind of, uh, different images <clears throat> of hell. Hells are inherently interesting, okay? because stuff happens there, and stuff that, that is scary, but you, you know, it's like horror movies. Like, you, people keep going to them, right? Is that you want to see these things. And they're, they're, they're fascinating realms. <clears throat> I'll give you an example, and we'll, we'll show some uh, photos of this later. There's one hell, this is uh, one of my uh, uh, students' favorite hells, is that it's the hell for people who, it's commonly translated in English as adulterers, but that doesn't really make sense because there isn't really a concept of adultery. Okay. It's the realm of sexual misconduct, or just love. people who, it's not the people that sex is wrong, or, or poor marriage after, it's not that. It's that if you abuse others through sex, or you control mentally, you can't think of anything else. Okay? So you're born in this hell, if you let a life that way, you're born in this hell. And then in this hell, you are in the realm, and these are murals, and manuscripts, and paintings, and, and um, descriptions of books, and you, modern comic books have these in South Korea. You find yourself in this realm, and you're naked. And you're running through a 
field. Now, does anybody know what elephant grass is? Yes. Grass, okay. Elephant grass. If you read a lot of common things that are like about the Vietnam War, you know, American soldiers often talk about elephant grass. And elephant grass is like switch grass. It's like six, eight feet tall, very, very sharp. And if you run through elephant grass, it will cut you. It's a very, very sharp, um, very thick blade uh, of grass. So in this realm, you're in a field of elephant grass, but you're naked. And running through it, it's like the worst paper cuts constantly you can imagine. Okay, well, you're like, that's not too bad for hell, right? I've heard more songs than that. But that grass is on fire, and it's covered in acid. Okay? So now it's getting a little more painful. And you're running through, and you're getting cut up, and you feel all the time. This is a very common thing about Buddhist health. You feel that there's someone behind you. Okay? You feel, you know, and if you do something wrong, right, you are always paranoid. I mean, you always feel like you're going to get caught. So imagine that all the time. You always feel like you're going to get caught, but you don't know what you did. Right? And so this kind of mass paranoia, there's somebody behind me, and I have to get away from them, and you can't see the person behind you. And you're getting caught up, and it's fire and acid, and you get to the side of a river, and you're oh, great. But well, there's still somebody coming, but I'm all on fire, and i got acid, and I'm cut up. I'm going to jump into the river, and you jump in the river. Oh, it's cool and refreshing. But the water starts getting very, very hot, and it's not comfortable, and it seems that the farther down you swim, the cooler it gets. So you keep swimming farther and farther down, and eventually you get to the bottom, but there's these giant spikes at the bottom of the river, and they're on fire, and they're covered in acid. And you hit them, and your body gets all cut up, and you float to the top, and you wander to the side of the river, you get up, and of course, more elephant grass, and you gotta run through that. And then you get to a tree, and this tree is very commonly depicted in Southeast Asia, a tree, and it's, wow, look at this tree. And your ideal lover is at the top of that tree, also naked. So it doesn't matter if you're homosexual or heterosexual, it doesn't matter what your ideal is, what your idea for desire is at the top of that tree. And you're like, well, good, because I've had a pretty bad day so far. And you get to the top of that tree. And you get to the top of the tree, and you start climbing it, and spikes come out of the tree on fire, covered in acid. And you're controlled by this desire so much to get there. And you eventually cover it, and the spikes go and you get and you touch the foot of your lover, and he or she is at the bottom. And you gotta go. And so for 10,000 years, you go up and down the tree. And so that is one of the hells. Another one of the hells is the hell I'm absolutely going to. This is, I, I might as well look forward to it because it's guaranteed. This is the hell where people abuse others with their words. Okay? And I do this to <laughs> students all the time. Grammar. <laughs> and so in this hell, you are constantly having your mouth pried open like a, like, a, like a python or something, right? You know, kind of the 180. And then molten kind of lava is like poured down your throat, okay, by these hell beings. And, it's kind of, and every time, and keep, people keep asking you questions. And every time you try to answer the question, they pour in more, okay? And so they're like, why aren't you answering? I'm trying to. So, and there's all other descriptions of the hell. You've got ones with worms burrowing out of you, and they're depicted all over the place in art, and we'll look at some of these. Okay? So you have all of these different levels. And this is kind of a, a vertical way of understanding the cosmos. And it's often depicted vertically. Um, and within these kind of vertical, if you imagine, you have the humans in the middle. Okay? And the humans are not great. It's not that they're perfect. It's not that they're ideal. It's just that they're the perfect medium between the Buddha, between luxury and deprivation. Okay? That they, it's a unique birth. Humans is a rare birth, and it's, it's a good birth, because this is the realm where you have enough cognitive ability to make decisions, and what Buddhists often call second and third order reflections. You have the ability to be sensitive to your own sensitivities. You have the ability to see yourself sad and reflect on your own sadness. See yourself happy and reflect on your own happiness. Okay? That this is something, for example, a cat can do. A cat doesn't reflect on its own catness. Okay? But a human can reflect on their human nature. They have that cognitive ability. And Buddhists say that that is a very important ability to have. Okay? Because you not only act, but you can think about your actions. And then you can change your actions. You're not controlled by instinct. You're not controlled by desire. Okay? You, have, you, you have self-awareness in a sense. But there is no self. But I won't go that. So 
you have this potential. Gods and goddesses have that cognitive ability, but they don't have any issues, so they don't have to work through those issues. You know, it's like when you, you know, if you know somebody who's like was born really rich, right, and that everything's fine with their life and going, but they make up drama, right? They have to have drama because, you know, even though they don't really have problems, they make up problems. That's what the gods' problems are. They're not real problems. And so they have funny rivalries going back and forth, but they don't actually have to deal with actual issues of eating and deal with issues of, you know, health care, things like that. You know, they, they, they live in a realm where things are taken care of for them. So they don't really need to reflect too much. And that's considered for Buddhists disappointing that they have a, that's too bad they don't get to do this. But on the other hand, Buddhists would say that if you're suffering all the time, climbing a spiked tree, or you work in, in just, if you think about it in, in everyday terms, you have two jobs, and you have three kids, and you barely have time to sit down and eat a meal. You, you don't have time to work through problems. You simply all day is consumed with simply getting through that day. You don't have the luxury, the time to reflect. And so some Buddhists say, well, it doesn't matter if these earth hells or heavens, is that every human being can be like this. They can be a person who's consumed by pain all the time, or a person who's so used to luxury, so used to not thinking, they don't reflect. And the perfect human, or the perfect realm, is a person who has enough problems that they have to reflect upon them, but enough time to reflect upon them. And if you're born this way, you're very, very lucky. Because that ability to reflect is what can lead you to realize your bond which is beyond duality, which is beyond self, and all those things. And so in the, in the cosmos, it's not, Buddhist cosmos, it's not that you naturally just want to go to heaven. It's actually, you're being reborn all the time, and heavenly beings are reborn too. They cycle too. They learn just, there's no permanent realm, and there's no permanent self. And so you're cycling through these things, and you kind of want to cycle to get to that human realm, and that's a very lucky birth or very fortunate person, you should say. And if you get to that, don't waste it. Don't waste it, use it as time and reflection. So that's a vertical notion of space. Then there's a horizontal notion of space. I won't go too much in this, but you'll see images when you're in Southeast Asia, and um, if you're teaching classes or things, and you're kind of looking for images of the cosmos, you'll see a lot of these, I'll show a few in a second. That's the world that is, has concentric circles with a place called Mount Mary, Mount Mary in the middle. Um, yeah. is Mount Kaka. So, you have this mountain in the middle of the world, and you have seven concentric circles around it. Trust me, it's, it's really good. So, you got this uh, Mount Meru in the middle, and there's seven concentric continents and between each continent you have an ocean, okay? And this is a notion of the world that they have the center, and then you have these four rivers that run out of that mountain. Okay? It's not that important, there's not a lot of text about this in Southeast Asia, but you see that image a lot, okay? And you also see images of this vertical uh, cosmos as well. So there's two notions of the cosmos, but theoretically, conceptually, they work the same way. So, when people start going to Southeast Asia and they start studying it, I think, especially if you're coming out of a modern Western context, meaning that you grew up with a notion of Buddhism, you've heard of it, right? That you've heard things like Dharma, Karma, your students are probably like this, right? They, they, they know these, I mean, those are terms that are in the Oxford English Dictionary. I mean, these are common terms that people use. They have this notion, I think, and I, many of my students certainly do, and I certainly did when I was, was a, a teenager as well, that Buddhists, um, you have this concept of a monk in a cave meditating, that they don't deal with the world too much, um, they're very uh, peaceful people, um, and these are all good stereotypes to have, right? That these are, you know, that Buddhism is a religion without a lot of myth, it's a religion without a lot of mysteries. It's the opposite of what maybe say Catholicism or something like this. It's that 
It's a religion that deals in reality. Okay? But if you go to Southeast Asia and you learn something about Buddhism, you'll know immediately that none of those stereotypes are exactly true. Is that Buddhists have many depictions of fantastic mythological worlds. Now, when I say mythological, I mean they're not true. I, I don't know, but they are true. Yeah. But these these fantastic heavenly and hell realms. And if you go into Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, you have things like Pure Land, you have um, uh, even Nirvana is depicted as a city sometimes, okay? That this is not an ethereal, non-formed kind of view, a materialist view of the universe. It's a very rich and mythological kind of view. Um, and so many of my students, and I'm sure your students will ask you the same thing, when you teach things about heavens and hells, the first question I always get is that, well, do Buddhists really believe in that? Do Buddhists really believe that there's a hell with a tree like this, or there's a heaven with a seven-jeweled tree that you know people dance around? And you know that's a good question. I think that's a legitimate question, but it's not a question you actually find a lot in Southeast Asia. You, I, I, I'm amazed that question of whether it's true or not, whether it's worth believing or not, how rare that question is, um, and. If you investigate it long enough, and you spend enough time with enough people, and you read enough text, I find, is that there's never one way of understanding the cosmos, never one way of understanding the universe. And so there's multiple possibilities of the ways to understand it. And so one of those possibilities is, and you'll find this very commonly, is that these realms are real. Is that there's 16 levels of hell, and there's 33 levels of heaven, and there's a realm of the hungry ghost, and that's completely normal, and that's completely real, and when I die, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to one of these, and hopefully the one I want to go to for a while. Or hopefully I'll be reborn as a human if I didn't really reflect, I didn't really achieve nirvana, and realize it during this life, maybe I'll get this chance again. So some ways just look at that. Other Buddhists in Southeast Asia will say, mm, eh, I don't know if they're true, Maybe these are just stories we tell. I don't know if they're not true. But they're good pedagogical techniques. Is that they're inspirational or they're fear-inducing? Okay. Is that you'll act better in this life if you think that your lust or your theft or your hunger or your kind of you know, thirst, tanha in Buddhism, will lead me to this hell. And you'll act better if you think that I will have a luxurious life if I treat people with compassion So some people look at it that you know. Other people I talk to, and, and you certainly find this um, in your sermons, um, in different contexts, is that all of these realms simply are aspects of your own mind. Is that the world, in a sense, even the world we're living in right now, doesn't exist. That's no more real than it has. This realm we see is that we project images onto the world. Is that none of you actually really exist, or you don't exist in the way I think you exist. You are projections of me, and I'm a projection of you. Right? And we do this all the time, right? Is that we assume certain motivations of them, and we assume certain things about their lives, and in our mind, those are absolutely true, right? Like, in my mind, Dallas Cowboys fans are evil to the core, right? <laughs> and whether that's true or not, that's the way I see the world, because I grew up in Philadelphia, okay? And so that's, true to me, but of course it's not true. I mean, they are evil, and that's true. But, you know, I'm sure they're But, is that you project these things onto the world. And so many times Buddhists teach that, well, you have all these depictions of heaven and hell. You have all these stories of the gods and goddesses, of hell beings, all these great bodhisattvas um, in Buddhism. There's not just one, but there's many. You have all these great stories, but in reality, they're just stories, but so is your life. Your life is just a story that you tell yourself. It's not true, right? And if somebody asks you, like, oh, tell me about your first date, or tell me about your first kiss, or tell me about when you got your first job, you tell them a story, right? Uh, I met her, and we went to LP Pizzeria, and I was 13 years old, and, you know, I've been, you know, watching her for months and months and months, and, I got her this water ice afterwards, and she really liked it, and I leaned in, and I tried it, and she rejected it. But it's a story I tell, right? It's 
destroy them. Whether that's true or not, whether factually in my mind that's true, that is not true. None of the stories we tell each other is true because I excluded the 17 other people in Alpine Pizzeria at that time who were also having lives. Okay? I excluded the person down the street who was starving okay, and didn't have any pizza. I excluded the fact that my brother also wanted to date this girl. You know what I mean? I take all of these things that are going on parallel in the universe, just in a very close universe, and I exclude them from my story. Okay? Because what is important is it's my story, and I'm the protagonist of that story. And that's the way we tell people our lives. You never tell the truth. You tell a version of the truth. Okay? And that truth is almost always from your perspective where you're the star. Even if you're putting yourself down, you're still the center of the world. And so many Buddhists in Southeast Asia would say that that's the way you have to think about the universe, is that we each have a story, and none of us are really telling the truth. And sometimes we share these stories, and we pick them up, and we share them. But we're just telling versions of different things. There is no truth in the world. That's the one. Other times, a perspective on the cosmos is, is that not only is it not true, but we can make it anything we want. The universe is what you make it. And so your perspective controls the world. And this is actually the first line of one of the most famous Buddhist texts I've ever written, the Dhammapada, is that the world is mind-made. The world is mind-made. And many Buddhists take this quite seriously. Is that what I see is only true to me. And my interpretation is only true to me. And that's one thing. But also, since that's true, I can make the world what I want to make it. And so if I want to suffer, I can suffer. If I don't want to suffer, I don't have to suffer. Is that I have enough power to interpret the world put myself in it in a way that it will have a good attitude. And we often say it's like positive psychology, right? Mm -hmm. Is that if you think something's going to be good, you, you know, picture it, you vision, you know, your successful day or something like that, you, it will happen, right? We'll just take that very, very seriously, okay? And so some say, you know, well, I just was born in this world and hopefully I will be born into this and, you know, I'm going to do the best I can. And people say, well, I'm not really just being moved along by the world. I can do something about it by simply the way I look at it. And so you have to, I just want you to hold these ideas and possibilities in your mind as we uh, go further into the cosmos. Okay. So you've got space. Whether it's real or not, doesn't matter. Now time. Time. Buddhist notions of time, very similar again to Vedic notions of time, and some adaptations, especially the concept in your mind. That time is endless, and there's no beginning and there's no end. There's beginningless, too. For example, there's 32 stories, common stories, in uh, early Sanskrit texts of creation, and they're all equally true, okay? Which means that none of them are true, right? They're all equally true. Buddhists have no creation story. There is no, it's interesting, a religion without a creation story. There is one called the Agana Sutta. It's a common Pali text. It's actually not that common. It is not about how the world was created, but it is kind of a story of, it doesn't start with the beginning of time, but it's about de-evolution. It's that the world will slowly get more and more divided. So the world might not have had a beginning, but it certainly is a progression. And it's getting more and more divided. And it's getting more and more selfish. Well, it used to be something that was less selfish. But again, Buddhist notions of creation and concept of creation, it's just not common. It's just not commonly taught. Most ideas is that time is endless and meaningless. Time is not non-divided, though. You have periods of time. And the most common period of time used in Southeast Asia is for cosmological time, grand time. Is a kalpa. This is translated in both languages. A kalpa is very, very long. Okay, sometimes it's translated as eon. Okay, and it's this incredibly long period of time. And the Buddha was asked one time, "Well, how long is it?" 
And the Buddha hated questions like this. Right? He hated questions about where did we come from, where did the universe come from, Nirvana wouldn't answer any of these questions. Or he would make some really snide and really nasty remark on it. Um, he was kind of nasty sometimes to people. Um, I mean, he just discounted their, their questions. One of these questions was about kalpas. And he said, okay, let me tell you what a kalpa is. Says, Imagine Mount Meru, this mountain in the middle of the world. That mountain is made out of pure diamond. This was a common belief that Mount Meru, in the center of the world, was made out of diamond. It just won't be diamond. A lot of times in, in Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, that mountain is imagined as Mount Kailash in Tibet. There was an actual mountain. If you see Mount Kailash, it does look like the largest mountain in the world. Because unlike, if, you, if anybody ever seen Everest, you know, okay. if you see Everest, for example, I remember I was really disappointed the first time I saw Everest. I mean, I was just like, this, wow, what, really? This is it? <laughs> because Mount Everest it looks like a foothill. Because you're already up there. Right? That it looks like one mountain among many mountains. You're like, really? Is that the tallest? It looks just slightly tall, a little bit, right? Because everything's tall, right? Is that if you have a seven foot five guy standing among a lot of seven foot two and seven foot three guys, the seven foot five guy doesn't look that tall, right? But if the seven foot five guy stands next to me, he looks really tall, right? And so Mount Kailash has nothing around it. It's like this mountain that comes out of the plain. And so, since there's no comparison, it looks like the tallest mountain on Earth, and they couldn't measure it. A lot of people imagine this. Okay? And it's also kind of got this one flat kind of face to it. So it just looks like it's solid rock. There's no vegetation on it. It's really imposing. So the Buddha used this image of Mount Meru, this solid block, nothing else around it. Imagine this mountain, the tallest mountain in the world, and a diamond. And then there's a bird. And that bird, has lived a long, long time. And that bird has a piece of silk hanging out of its beak. You just you know, imagine a bird kind of picking one just a little piece of silk, right? right. And this bird flies over the mountain. And this bird flies over the mountain. And once every hundred years, the bird passes the mountain. And the piece of silk hanging from its beak brushes the top of the mountain as it, as it flies by. And it only brushes the top of the mountain once every hundred years. The Buddha said, by the time that bird wears down that mountain to dust, is one kalpa. <laughs> How long do the gods live in the 31st heaven? Okay, in this version of the Rupa Oh, 80,000 kalpas. Meaning, stupid question, shut up. Okay? <laughs> is that time is too big, it's not worth imagining. And so since time is so long, is that no matter how we define it, no matter how we separate ourselves, no matter how we place ourselves, we are insignificant. It's like, you know, when you were young watching Carl Sagan, right? You never felt more like nothing until you watched Carl Sagan, right? It's like 13 billion stars, like that, you know, the naked eye can see or whatever, you know what I mean? And, and that's only, you know, 1% of the known universe, okay? Is that you're nothing. The Buddhist notions of time, you're, you're nothing. You're nothing. In the larger scheme of things, you don't matter. And so what matters is not where you are in the universe, or where you're going, or how old you are, how young you are, how many lives you've lived. I so I've lived 100,000 calls. That doesn't mean anything. Since time is so unfathomable, is that the only thing that matters is how you perceive time at any given moment. No. That's what matters. And so it takes this huge notion of a universe with many levels and long time and puts it back onto you. Is that time is what you make of it. Time is what you create. And so any division you make in something that that's long is arbitrary. You can call something boring time or family time short time, a long time, right? Like right now, the first cup of coffee is starting to wear off. I can tell. You really do with you. Okay? It's wearing off. I understand that. Okay? I understand. You give me about 20 minutes, you're going to start to see that with me too. Okay? And so time was really exciting in the beginning. Ooh, but there's too much text on the pictures. And that coffee's starting to wear off. And that time that was, oh, this is going to be about Buddhism, but I don't really understand what's going on. And time is getting slowly worse. 
worse. And it's a nice day outside, right? And you're like, man, I could be at a farmer's market. You know, I could be sitting at home with my feet up. Time doesn't matter what it is on the clock. It's how you perceive that time that matters. And for some of you, this is great because you like you know, the cosmos. For other people, it's just like, can we just get the other stuff? So, <laughs> it's divided. And it doesn't actually exist until we perceive it in the body. It's like painting the wind, right? You don't know how to paint the wind, so you paint a tree with leaves moving, right? That's the only way to depict the wind is by something else. Somebody says, draw time. Like, if you get that in charades, okay, <laughs> that sucks, right? Damn it, why didn't I get, like, ice cream cone? You know what I mean? I got time. You can't draw time. You only can draw the divisions of time. Okay? You can mark it. And so, you have to situate your own body within these notions of time and space. And so, when you're teaching about Southeast Asia, and you're looking at art, and you're looking at text, and they seem so grand, and they seem so complex, remember that all is related how you perceive it. And so any notions of the largest things in the world, the biggest things in time, always comes back to you, and how you perceive it. And in a sense, you don't exist. So, we're going to go into that. So, rebirth. How do you move in time and space? Mm -hmm. How does Buddhists see themselves as moving in time and space? Okay? And there's one thing that's happening with large notions of time and space. But it only matters to you how you move it. Because you can't imagine these time, these large time, those spans of time and large notions of space in many realms. And I'm just going to go through this relatively quick. Rebirth, transmigration, and reincarnation. These are things that are really, really difficult to understand. I'll say, say a few statements, but I'm going to have to qualify each one of them. First, Buddhists don't believe in reincarnation or rebirth. There is no text, teaching text, about what happens after death that says that you are reborn and reincarnated into another body. Okay? Very common in Jainism, very common in many types of Hindu texts, many different schools, but not in Buddhism. Because you have no self, Buddhist positive having yourself, especially Theravada Buddhist in Southeast Asia, there is no self. There is nothing that moves through time from one body to the next. There is, you're not a vessel that has a little glowing ball in it that when you die, the glowing ball goes into another body. Okay? It's not a one-to-one -one transfer. That being said, there is no textual justification that there is rebirth in Buddhism. That being said, most Buddhists believe in rebirth. And think about the way they move through the universe as being being born in one body to the next. Okay? Is that even though they don't posit a soul, a like monk or a nun or lay person, telling you about the soul, oh, there is no soul, there is no self, anatta, 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 no self, no substance, no man. But then they'll talk about what's going to happen to them after death and where you're going to go, what happened to their father and and then you read many, many Jataka texts about the Buddha being reborn over and over again. And so it's very, very confusing. There isn't a concept of rebirth. Rebirth is impossible because there is no self. But then all the stories in the art and the way people talk about their families and their friends seem to do this. For example, in Thai, very, very common. Okay? Chat down, chat down, chat down, chat down. This life, the last life, the next life. So it's a common joke made in Thailand. Like if you're particularly good at something, okay? You're particularly, like you've never done it before, but you just seem to be a natural at it. People will say, oh, tap out, you were this. Very common. You must have been good at this, okay? Like I'm often because I eat very, very quickly, okay? I tend to eat very, very fast and put food in front of me, boom, I eat fast. And so the common joke is that in the last life I was a pig. <laughs> and I was, you know, and that I'm, I, I trained how to eat that fast. So I was really good at it. And this, and it's a common joke people make. But they talk about it as if there's rebirth, even though there's no, you know, theoretical, conceptual, doctrinal justification for that teaching. 
or for that belief. Okay? So some people believe in how you move through time in that very, I would call, conventional way. Very conventional. I have a body, it has something in it that I can't identify, it makes me who I am. It's not a soul, it's not a self, but it's uh, And then when I die, it does something and it goes into another body. Convention. Then there is, if you press, oftentimes you press a nun or a monk on this. Okay, well, you say, you know what? Is it really work that way? Well, according to Tyson, no. It doesn't work that way. And the most common story you'll hear is the two candle story. The worst metaphor ever. They use it all the time. You got a candle that's lit, and you got a candle that's unlit. And your body is lighting one candle the next body. When you die, it's like the flame moving you. And then they hold up two candles, right? Which are the flames different or the same? Right? I don't know. I mean, I don't, like, they're same and different, right? And that's like, well, that's your answer. Well, that's not an answer. Okay? That's not an answer. You move this, well you move, but you don't move your same and not different. Okay, it's just, it doesn't work that way. Okay, but then you'll hear that a lot. Okay, but ignore that story, because it doesn't work. If you really think about it, and you really concentrate, it doesn't work, okay? But then, if you press farther with people, okay, or you press farther into the text, you get start to get very complicated notions of your place in space and time. And this is where I find it gets very interesting. So, let's go back to time. Time is very, very long. It's so long that if there is rebirth, you have lived every possible life you will ever live. Every possible life. You've all been slaves, you've all been queens, you've all been you know, raccoons, you've all been gods and goddesses in this realm, and in this realm you've all lived in each one of the hells. You've not only lived in each one of the hells, but you've lived as this particular body, this type of hell, in this particular body. You've not only lived a life as an ant, but you lived a life as an ant in Brazil, you lived a life as an ant as a, you know, an ant in Lowell, Massachusetts. Is that every permutation of anthood you've experienced, every permutation of slavehood you've experienced, every permutation of godhood you've experienced. Okay? Time is so long that if you stretch it out, you, every possibility that you could have possibly had, you've already done. And if that's true, then it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in a heaven, it doesn't matter if you're hell, it doesn't matter if you're 80,000 couples in or one couple in. It doesn't matter. Because when you stretch out time that long, we're all equal. We all are reduced to the same thing, meaning that we all are nothing. And when the Buddha was experiencing uh, the night of the night of awakening, is that that's one of the parts of the Night of the Awakening. It's a nine hour period, he's cycling through every life that he's ever lived. And he goes through it the first, the first watch in the night. He's cycling through every life that he's ever lived. And he sees them all stretched out, billions and billions of lives. And the only thing he notices about all these lives stretched out is that they are exactly the same. Different outfits, Different voices, different heights, different bodies. Just up, down, up, down, up, down. Born, get old, get sick, die. Born, get old, get sick, die. Is that the only constant in the universe is that you just keep moving? And the, there's no difference between a life and a breath. That's all existence is. And then the second watch of the night, he saw that every single person in the world did the exact same thing. It wasn't just his train of lives. Everybody experienced that. And the only answer to that is, what do you do next? Is radical empathy. Is that no matter what place in the universe you're on, no matter what your perspective is, is that you are no better than an ant on the back of a buffalo in Cambodia. 1976. That's all you are. So some people see that that's how you move through time and space. A little depressing, but also quite liberating. Because, you know what, well, it's a lot of world off my back because I don't have to say anything. You know, like, well, you're just, yeah. Good. Then, you can 
progress further. We get this in a little later on down the text too. That's great conversations about this. Is that there is no time. If you stretch out time long enough, it doesn't matter. Just as if you if you don't divide time, it doesn't exist. If you stretch out time long enough, it's simply an illusion. Because if there is no real meaning to life, it's just up and down. And it doesn't actually exist. And so it's not that time is long or space is big. It's that there is no time and space. And then you can get really radical. And this is the notion that not only is there no time and space, there's no you. So there's no person perceiving it. So it's not actually perception, because there's no perceiver. And that's what we're going to move on to next. You are in time and space. You imagine yourself being in time and space right now. Okay? You imagine, you feel the weight of your body, right? You feel the tension in your muscles. Okay? You feel the weight on your face. Okay? You move, you have, you know, neurology, but you have limbic discharges, right? Some people tap their legs, some people chew their pencils, some people you know, like, tend to pull the hairs out of my eyebrows. Okay? You have limbic discharges. You feel your body constantly. Okay? You're aware of your body. Okay? This is constantly reinforced. You wake up, you look in the mirror, you take a shower. Okay? You are constantly reminded that you exist. Your senses are telling you that. However, do you really exist? And how do you confirm that? So I can talk to somebody else. I remember this philosophy teacher I had, and um, he was going off and off about uh, Berkeley's, Berkeley's theory of um, the universe and Berkeley's theories of existence and how nothing existed. And I said, well, if nothing exists, go slam your head against the wall. Go slam your head against the wall. And he like laughed and you know what I mean, things like that. But like I really meant it. Like, well, if nothing exists, then you know what I mean? Like, see what happens if you slam your head against the wall. Okay? You'll feel existence really, really quick for about three seconds, and you won't feel anything after that, right? Because <laughs> you hit the floor. Okay? But what does it mean to mean that you don't exist and you don't perceive? What does that actually mean? Well, for Theravada Buddhists in Southeast Asia, it means that there is no central perceiver. Okay? There's no person here that is different from all the other people. You are made up of many, many things. The person is constructed of non-person things. The I is made up of non-I things. And the most common story told about this is the story of the chair. So you have a monk and a famous uh, king, and they're discussing things. And this king, who's not Buddhist, he's not a monk, he's saying, tell me about this this idea you say that there's no self, there's no soul. Very common things to you. Explain this to me. I don't really get that. Because I'm here, I exist. You know? I think I have memories. And the monk says, look at that chariot. He goes, yeah, yeah, that's my chariot. He goes, tell me which part of the chariot is the chariot. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, tell me which part of the chariot is the chariot. Um, the wheel? We don't know the wheel's the wheel. The spokes? No, the spokes are spokes. The breastplate? No, that's the breastplate. The axle? No, that's the axle. The reins? No, that's the reins. Oh, the platform? No, that's the platform. Where's the chariot? Show me what part of the chariot is the chariot. He goes, well, it's all those things put together. He goes, exactly. That's what you are. That's what you are. You perceive yourself as singular, but you're fragmented. You perceive yourself as thinking, as thinking as a singular being, but you're actually you're made up of memories, you're made up of influences, right? None of you chose your own name, right? None of you chose, say, you know, when you're four, I think I'm going to speak English, right? That's the language I'm going to choose. You can choose that. You didn't choose where you're going to live. You didn't choose your social security number, right? You didn't choose your grandparents. Oh, I think I'm going to choose my grandparents today. No. You were born into something. You are made up of others. Genetically, you're made up of others, and you're made up of the universe. You, I wish I could have done the basketball stuff. I remember when I was, you know, in high school and I played basketball. Dunk the basketball. That those years are long gone. Okay? Long gone. Okay? Because gravity and age is caught up with it. Okay? I 
am connected to the Earth because of gravity. I have to use oxygen. I'm not an independent, self-contained being. I need the world. Just as you didn't choose your language, you didn't choose where you're from, you were grown into something, you're made of other things. You also can't choose to separate yourself from it. You can't go off and live in a cave and be separate. You still have to breathe, you still have to deal with food, you still have to deal with gravity. You think you're independent, you think you make your own decisions, but you don't. And you're made up of five parts. One of those five parts. Before I go into that, because once I get into the five parts, because I'm not stopping. Do people have any questions? About time, space, anything less important? I just have one question. Um, you've been talking about text, scripture and text, etc. So you've been giving the, the, the party line, if I may. But do the common people, common people, the masses, ever uh, in Southeast Asia, get this in the depth about Buddhism? Absolutely, 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 yeah, you do. It matters, of course, your, your engagement with it, okay? Yeah. But yeah, this is a common, this, the, the, the notions of time and space are common in the told stories, they're common in sermons, mm -hmm. um, they're common in texts, they're common in murals. Okay, we're gonna look at a lot of those images. The second half of this is gonna be a lot of images um, yes, and then as much education as you want to do, as much as pressing. That's why I'm saying, well, you can look at it many different ways. Some people look at it this way, some people look at it this way, and some people simultaneously look at it three or four ways. It matters what conversation they're in at the time. And so absolutely. And then what I'm about to talk about next, absolutely. That is a very, very common notion of what the body is made of and how you perceive. However, it's difficult to maintain that notion of radical notions of time and space itself and actually make it work. I mean, I mean that, that's something, right? I mean, like, I mean, if I, I was, grew up Irish Catholic, okay? We went to Mass every morning at 6.30 in the morning. Strict Irish Catholic, all boys school. I didn't go to class with a girl until I was in college. And I went to a Catholic college while I was in college, okay? And so Catholic, 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 okay? So I know it back and forth. And if I really thought about Catholicism all the time, I wouldn't be able to function, okay? I really wouldn't because it's super depressing. Okay? And that I understand that I'm nothing, and I understand that I was born with sin, and all of these things I was taught, I understand them. But I, don't, I can't really think about them all the time because, you know, i got to get to work. Right? And I think many Buddhists are like that, too. Except if you get long conversations, you press, and you go over and say text, I think, yeah, I don't think there's a difference between a scholar and a common person and their ability to understand these things. I think it's how am I going to occupy my time? You know, and some people love those long conversations you get into, right? But then sometimes you don't want to get into those long conversations. You just want to get through your day. I think people change in their life and they change within their day. It's a good question. Thank you. Justin, um, when you're talking about the guide and time, you know, the story you put a lot of kids, there's a sort of general concern at certain points in time. The Buddhist teachings that only last for a certain period of time. So that seems to be a common anxiety among ordinary people that were coming. That's, it. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Um, there's a concept in Buddhism, uh, Theravada, all Buddhist schools actually have this, this concept. They just mark it different ways. Um, you might have heard the term mapo. It's actually mapo. It's uh, the Japanese way of, of doing this. That time is slowly going down. Okay? And that it's not that time will end. It's that the teachings, mm -hmm. as that Professor Dai said, the teachings will slowly disappear. And so people won't even have the content of it. And it's going to be, for most people in Southeast Asia, it's a 5,000 year period. And we are at, we got 2,400 and, how many left? 2,443 left? 43 years left, I think? I think something like that before we're already done, right? So we've gone over the halfway point, so it's going to get really, really bad. Is that the Buddha gave a teaching, and then in 5,000 years he said that teaching, no one will understand anymore. We'll still exist, we'll still go on, but we'll have lifespans about 10 years long, we will only speak in grunts, and you know, we will just you know, kind of beat each other up, it'll be kind of like a zombie world, and no one will know the teachings because no one will be able to pass them down. So there is this notion that time is getting worse and worse and worse, and it's gonna to get to a really low point, and then a new Buddha will come along, and that new Buddha will like trail, and my trail will restart the teaching. And I'll have to start at a pretty basic level because you got a lot of 10-year-old 
you know, eight preachers and you gotta <laughs> and, 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 you know, and so uh, but yeah, that's that's a very common notion. And then also there's so many different notions of time in, in Southeast Asia is that you have Vamsa's chronicles, and Vamsa is actually from Sanskrit word for bamboo, so we have this you know magic time is stacked, you know, like bamboo, you know, and then you have these segments in that. You have these chronicles of Buddhas over time, Bodhisattvas, kings over time, and there's different notions of how time moves. Um, but generally, time is either going down very quickly or starting up. It's way, time's way. And anybody say, oh, who's believing cyclical time? Those people are liars. Okay. Time just moves in cycles. Time moves in ways. And you go, oh, everything that's happened now has happened before. No, that's not true. Time is always changing, but it has regular patterns. We have a little bit of time before the break. Let's see if we can talk about what you're made of. Because in the second part, I really do want to get to kind of out of time and space and into the room. So what are you? If you're not a self that perceives, what are you? Well, you're made up of five things. You're made of actually 84,000 things, according to the text, but they're divided, I'm going to go 84,000 in into five, five categories of things. These are called the shandhas or the khandhas. First is rupa. You've heard that term before. Form. Form. You have this. You have form. So if you hit your head against the wall, you will feel it. Okay? For most Buddhists. Yogacharan Buddhists say no, that doesn't exist either. For most Buddhists, Terrapana Buddhists, no, you do have form. Form includes your senses, how you not only your form, but how you perceive in contact with other forms, how you see form, hear form, taste form, touch form. Okay? You have form. Then you have Waitanat. Waitanat is emotions. And it's not really kind of emotions like joy and love and pain, that's what I say. But at a basic level, we only have two emotions. And that is okay? That's the two emotions. I want, oh, I'm afraid. Okay? And so when you perceive, you perceive, that's the first thing that goes through your mind. Okay? First thing, according to this, this is it. And you perceive, ooh, coffee, right? Or fire. Okay? But you don't consciously think of that. That's how you move through the world. That's why we can negotiate crowns very quickly. That's why we can you know, be in a cell phone and getting on you know, subways and everything. Is that our mind is constantly going, good, not good, good, not good, run away, run towards, run away, run towards. Wait to know. That's your basic emotion. Sanya. Sanya. This is when you reflect upon those emotions. You, your label maker, your rubric maker, how you make taxonomies, how you at 16. 